Revisiting something that meant a lot to you when you were younger can be dangerous. Like when you find out that that band that made that CD you used to love in middle school has some very bad political opinions, or finally drive out to that farm your parents took your old dog to live at and find a glue factory where the address should be. Or like when you find out that that horror game you remember as being so clever and intriguing and scary when you were a kid got a remaster last year and decided to give it a try. I am talking about Ib, or maybe it's Eeb. I hope it's not because I'm not going to be pronouncing it like that in this video. Ib was released in 2012 for free by a pseudonymous Japanese game developer known only as Kuri. I personally would consider it as one of the holy trinity of the RPG Maker horror games. RPG Maker is a program with many incarnations that essentially gave amateur game devs a DIY way to make their own games. But this isn't like primitive or rudimentary software or anything. You still very much need to know your stuff to be successful. I remember downloading it as a kid thinking I could make my own game, and my experience was like if you grabbed a Neanderthal and asked him to file your quarterly tax returns. But anyways, the holy trinity of RPG Maker games, in my humble opinion, were Ao Oni, Yume Nikki, and Ib. Well, there's one more significant RPG Maker game, but let's not talk about it. All three of these games were made by mysterious, anonymous Japanese developers, were more or less horror adventure games, and were incredibly popular for Let's Players back in the day on YouTube. Yume Nikki is probably the most influential and beloved of them, but the other two have their own significance. I first remember downloading Ib off the developer's website, where it's still hosted to this day, though I'm not sure how it first got on my radar. Anyways, last year Ib received a remaster and was republished on Steam by Playism. The remake is no longer free, but hey, you can still download the original off Kuri's website for free for those of you who still need to get your money up. From what I can tell, not a whole lot has changed. The graphics got a lot cleaner, and some of the puzzles that use Banana Brain logic got simplified. Although my memories are with the original, let's give the remake a try. In the early afternoon, under a grey sky, our story begins. You play as a young girl named Ib, who is visiting an art gallery with her parents, hosting an exhibition by the prolific painter, Y Square Tana. Your mother tells you that she doesn't doubt that even you will enjoy it, which seems a bit passive-aggressive. Ib's parents stop by the information desk, allowing you to begin exploring the art gallery as long as you don't bother the other visitors. The collection itself is quite varied, and you can talk to many of the other gallery goers, or perhaps you're just listening to them talk to themselves? I'm not sure, it's not always clear. There's even one guy who says that a painting makes him want to wet himself, which seems like an okay thing to say to an unfamiliar child in an art gallery. Most of the artworks are paintings, like the painting of a man hanging by his ankles that this purple hair anime guy in a spiky trench coat who totally won't be a major character later is standing in front of. But there's also a lot of bizarre sculptures, like these freaky headless mannequins in primary color dresses, or the statue of a giant rose resting on its coiled stem. Though the main attraction of the gallery seems to be the giant painting on the main floor of an anglerfish prowling the depths of the sea. I love the vibe of this section. The rainy day in the art gallery checking out the paintings and statues away from your parents' gaze. But what I really love about this section is the fact that when you examine the work's titles, some of the words are censored with purple question marks. The game lets us know that these words are those that Ib, being a young kid, is unfamiliar with. I thought this was such a cool decision because it reminded me of myself as a kid visiting art museums and being confronted by big words that I didn't understand in the painting titles and the placards. In fact, I remember as a kid not knowing what the word untitled meant and being like, damn, this word must mean something really cool since so many artists named their painting that. But this one decision to keep the true titles of the painting obscured is what got me thinking about the relationship between kids and art. Did your parents ever take your art museums when you were a kid? Not children's museums, but actual serious adult art museums. Mine did. Whether we were traveling in an unfamiliar city or just going to the local art museum to get out of the house on a rainy weekend, I have many memories of art museums. I think children have a unique relationship with art in places like this. See, I feel like adults mostly go to art museums to learn. Maybe about a specific period of art, maybe about a new painter, maybe even just to pretend they like learning to give off the image that they're cool and educated. Kids though, well, kids go to art museums because their parents or schools make them, but what kids actually do at art museums before they get bored is actually looking at art. Looking specifically at what interests them or piques their curiosity. Which for most kids would be something visually striking, bizarre, or interactive. Kids want something that shocks them, grips their imagination, captures their desires or fantasies. In a way, they are either the worst or the best observers of art because they take what they see at face value, without reading a placard, knowing about the artist's background, or trying to examine the themes behind the work. I remember as a kid being confronted with Goya's Saturn devouring his son in an art museum in Madrid and not being able to look away while also being scared to look closer. It's not because I appreciated the myth behind the painting or understood that this is a reflection of the artist's mental state and trauma. I was just enthralled that something so shocking, so ghoulish and horrifying, would be exhibited in a place like this. I remember the green color of the cannibal god's face, the toothless maw of his mouth, the doughy slackness of the half-eaten body he gripped in his hands. As a kid, I was obsessed with monsters in the macabre and was constantly drawing them. But Goya seemed to have captured an actual monster, and here it was on the walls of the museum for everyone to see. But what I found even more interesting is how kids interact with modern art at the museum. I think kids understand that many of the classic paintings and sculptures are made to look pretty or cool, to tell a story or depict a moment in time. But what about a giant robot arm locked in a Sisyphean task to mop up the blood flooding out from its base? Or the corpse of a tiger shark encased in a glass tomb filled with green gel? You and I can read about this art, realize how it relates to some prescient social issue or some universal pain of the human existence and say, aha, I get it, even if we don't really get it. But to a kid, these pieces have something bizarre and unsettling about them. What is this object? Why would someone make it? Why is it here of all places? 
I remember as a kid thinking that there was something inherently scary about many modern art pieces, something dark and grim that made me want to find my parents as soon as I could. I think I still sort of have this feeling today. I know you could argue that's usually not the artist's intention, but I seldom feel comfortable around most modern art. I remember as a kid in my local museum, there was a piece of art in the modern section that was just a dimly lit room with what looked like a gray rectangle of wall on the opposite side of the door. You'd stick your arms out right in front of you like a mummy in an old movie and walk slowly to the other side of the room. Once you reached the gray rectangle, one of two things would happen. Either you'd lower your arms instinctively to avoid ramming your hands into the walls, or you'd keep them up and a shiver would run up your spine when your hands would touch empty air instead of a solid wall. Because the gray rectangle was actually a recess in the wall, empty space creating an illusion in the low lights of the room. It was exhilarating and fun, and I liked showing it to other people, but there's something eerie about it as a kid. Why wouldn't an adult do this? It felt oddly like the artist was playing a trick on you. A not very nice trick. Anyway, let's keep these ideas in mind and go back to the game. Eventually, you wander upstairs and find a colossal painting that depicts a colorful, dreamlike world. When you exit the room, the gallery is suddenly completely empty and still, the only noise is being some odd thumping footsteps from somewhere else in the building. Your parents are nowhere to be found. The paintings in the gallery start to get a little, um, active. When you return to the room with a large painting, you find an ominous message on the wall, and the words Come Ib splatter across the floor. You follow footprints of paint back to the anglerfish painting and take the plunge. You find yourself in a nightmare version of the gallery, with more ominous messages from some unseen figure beckoning you forward. Here's where the game itself begins. Ib is about navigating the nightmare world of the art gallery that she's found herself in, solving creepy puzzles, avoiding dangers, and withstanding jump scares. You grab a rose resting in a vase of water, the petals of which will serve as your health bar. In a room directly next to you is a painting of a woman that makes a face that I'm sure was a lot scarier in 2012. The puzzles in the first area are pretty simple but cool. I don't want to get bogged down in describing them because I think someone explaining how to solve different adventure game puzzles to you is probably even worse than someone trying to explain a joke to you. Suffice it to say they're centered around the paintings and pieces of art you find. Maybe if you do something correctly an object in a painting falls out and you can use it. Maybe a figure in a painting offers a riddle you can solve to advance. There definitely is an overt macabre theme to most of the paintings and many of them try to unsettle you if not outright scare you. The scares don't hit too hard if you've been around the block with horror game. What's more interesting are the small details meant to unnerve you or establish a surreal atmosphere. Like this one, where you have to figure out which of the figures in the painting is actually telling the truth and which are lying. When you solve the puzzle and go back to the room, all of the other paintings that lied have brutally killed the truth teller. If I had to use a word to describe them, I'd call them charming. Which I think is something you want to go for with adventure game puzzles, but maybe not when you're explicitly trying to scare the player. Although who am I to say that's what the developer was going for. There is some enemy avoidance, like the headless mannequins that chase you around or these women's torsos that pop out of their canvases and pursue you. Now is probably a good time to talk about sight and sound. The game looks pretty good for what it is. It does look a lot like Yume Nikki though, from the sprite of the protagonist to the enemies and some of the artworks and especially the doors, though these might be preset RPG Maker assets. It does have a clearer, more refined look though, and I think things got sharpened even more in the remaster. All in all, the game has a very cozy, nostalgic look to it that I think most of these RPG Maker games have. The remake gave the characters much more detailed dialogue sprites when they're talking, and even though they technically look better, I do like the old ones more. The new portraits look almost too clean, while the old ones have this kind of uncanny charm to them, with the little frames and strange shadows playing on the oddly soft looking skin on the characters' faces. I think in general the older game has a much more charming look, with its chunkier sprites and the little low def rose in the top corner that some goth kid would make his MySpace wallpaper back in 2011. I prefer it to the original, but I don't think that's objective. Chalk it up to my own nostalgia. The game's sound design is really, really good. The music especially is incredible. I can't fully tell if it's original music. One song is definitely based around La Folia, a musical theme that's been kicked around Europe since at least the 1400s, and I did find a Japanese guitarist on YouTube that seems to have created some of the songs. No matter what, the music fits the game perfectly, and does the heavy hitting and crafting the atmosphere. There's some lullaby-like tunes with toy piano and music box melodies, especially near the beginning. When the player arrives at the Nightmare Gallery, the music is mostly moody and understated, gloomy synths and plinky pianos. Some moments even strike me as slightly jazzy, especially a couple of the chords in the track dining room. It's music that works just as well in a horror game as a rainy day study playlist. Another thing I think is cool is that each of the main characters seem to be associated with a specific instrument. Abe with a toy piano, and the other two characters with a flamenco -y guitar and music box respectively. As I was playing, I realized the main thing that stuck with me so much over the years is the music, and it was a joy to experience again. The soundtrack fits the setting beautifully, perfectly embodying the creepy art museum on a rainy day that forms Ib's setting. Anyway, we continue solving unnerving art-themed puzzles until we meet the same silent anime guy from the gallery passed out on the ground. You bring him a blue rose that matches your red rose and he gets resuscitated. The man explains that he's also been trapped in the gallery and tells us his name is Gary, which I think is such a hilarious choice. Like they took this anime boy with purple hair and a spiky Shinigami jacket and gave him the name that your friend's stepdad who's been collecting scrapped cars on the front yard ever since he lost a job at Home Depot would have. 
Gary seems like a pretty nice guy though, and if we take his word for it, he's just as lost as you. He tells us that he'll be accompanying us to protect us before getting jump scared by Drop of Pain. Now, I'm not good at the anime tropes at all, but he very much fits that character who acts really confident and put together, but in reality is really cowardly and childish. I don't know, I think this trope was much more lovable and ingratiating when this game came out, but now after all these years, his character feels slightly grating, but not to the point of not being charming whatsoever. From here on out, Gary joins your party. He can occasionally move something that's too heavy, but mostly he just serves as a character you can consult as you go room to room, usually offering a basic hint or observation on the atmosphere. Next up, we solve more puzzles with Gary. What I do like about the gameplay of Ib is that, often in a large, complex series of rooms, there will be multiple mini-puzzles going on at once, with each having solutions and resources that help you progress in the other puzzles, as well as the level in general. It does keep the gameplay feeling much more clever and less monotonous. A highlight of this is the next room that features many different puzzles, as well as more of the painting ladies that slowly come to life as you progress. The room is quite big, so it's not too hard to avoid them, but it's still a cool feeling knowing they're prowling somewhere. Eventually, you come to a room that features a portrait of your mother and father. Gary senses you're upset and tries his best to console you before more of the painting ladies burst into the room. After a wild chase through the level, you reach safety and collapse. You find yourself in a dreamscape without your Rose or Gary, with visions of your parents looking for you but not being able to see you or hear you. When you find a water glass to regenerate your Rose, the flower falls apart, and two statues chide you, saying, you didn't take care of it so it broke, and you shouldn't have lost it. Rejoiners from childhood that will probably be all too familiar for most of us. Eventually you're cornered by an especially freaky painting monster and wake up in the relatively safe room with Gary, whose trench coat is laid across you like a blanket. It's a sweet gesture, but look how spiky this thing is, I mean how comfortable can that have been? Gary comforts you and applauds you for your bravery in getting this far mostly by yourself. I think it's important to note how different his demeanor is than the other adult characters in the game. Though he still treats you like a child, he's much more concerned and interested in hearing how you feel and what you think, rather than your mother, who takes a mostly dismissive and annoyed tone with you. Eventually you leave the safe haven of the room and go back into the menacing atmosphere of the gallery in search of an exit. You follow a trail of what's either blood or just red paint into a hallway and find another human character, a girl named Mary. She's initially terrified and nonverbal before Gary introduces the two of you and calms her down. She says she also wants to escape the gallery and joins the party. That said, Mary does seem oddly nonplussed by the horrors of the gallery, with a slightly exaggerated childish demeanor. She's definitely bearing up much better than what you'd expect a little girl to act like in this situation. Not long after her joining your party, a wall of thorns separate you and Mary from Gary. Mary suggests splitting up to find a way out, but Gary's much more reluctant. Eventually though, he relents and you and Mary start exploring on your own. You find some odd messages on the wall. I want you to have fun, Ib. Come to a fun world without any grown-ups. Now begins probably the most fun part of Ib from a gameplay perspective. You switch back and forth from controlling Ib and Gary. Solving puzzles on one side changes the world on the other side. Thus the gameplay feels much more engaging and it's fun to make connections between the two and try to figure out how your actions in Ib's room will affect Gary's rooms and vice versa. While doing so, you have a number of conversations with Ib where Mary seems oddly clingy, making plans with Ib for what they'll do when they escape and asking Ib straight up if she'd rather escape with Gary or her. Gary, on the other hand, is being stalked by a creepy doll that implores him to pay attention to it. Near the end of the area, Gary gains access to a book that describes some of Guertana's artwork. Under the M heading, he finds a record for a painting called Mary, described as the last work of Guertana's life, and the paired illustration is of a painting of our new friend. Gary panics, realizing that Mary's another one of the artworks come to life, and rushes to make sure Ib is safe with her. I honestly can't evaluate how good of a twist this is because my memories of first encountering it are foggy at best. It's a cool idea that she's an artwork come to life, but Mary was basically just introduced to us, so it lacks some emotional oomph as a surprise reveal. The artwork come to life trope has clearly fascinated humans for a long time. From the ancient myth of Pygmalion to Ghostbusters 2 to that one quest in Oblivion with the painted trolls, and with good reason. Art is the expression of our subconscious, our fantasies, or desires. We must ask ourselves, what were Guertana's intentions in creating Mary? What was he trying to express or exercise from himself in this seemingly harmless, angelic-featured little girl? Anyways, Gary rushes to save Ib, but first has to brave a room of creepy dolls. I really don't like dolls, and this is probably one of the best executed scary sequences in the game. If you find the key in time, you can escape, but this is really hard. I save scum my way to eventually finding the key and escaping the room, so it is possible, but I'm not sure what its repercussions are. I think it has to do with what ending you get, more on that later though. On Ib's side, after Gary discovers her secrets, Mary freaks out and runs away, and shortly after confronts Ib. If you were able to get the key though, Gary appears, and him and Mary have a quick tussle which leads to him shoving her onto the ground, which looks a bit sad considering it's a grown man pushing over a small girl. Mary is now incapacitated, and Ib and Gary's reunion is rather sweet, but there's a little time to waste. You escape the room and find yourself in a bizarre, crayon-shaded world, peopled with children's drawings, including large ones of you, Gary, and Mary. This is a larger zone with multiple environments that each contain their own puzzles. I like the vibe of this area, and the crayon location drawings definitely seem true to life for how a child actually draws. The seemingly innocent atmosphere though is undercut with an ominous lullaby trek, and a very disconcerted Mary stalking you too with a palette knife. There's also a little memory game here based on the different drawings in the zone backgrounds. There's many things I'm bad at in life, but memory games are not one of them.
Now I think here's where the game diverges based on what ending you have. The good ending isn't tied to a specific dialogue choice or something, it's very arcane on how to get it, and though it adds more content, I'm just going to be covering the ending I got, one of several bad endings. Getting the good ending definitely involves talking to Gary a set number of times. If you're interested in the other endings though, there's lots of videos here on YouTube that feature them. Anyways, in my playthrough, Mary ambushes you and Gary and pushes the two of you into a giant toy box. After some more shenanigans, Mary gets your red rose, and Gary effectively sacrifices himself by offering his blue rose to get yours back. It's a pretty sweet moment between the characters. As you and Gary pursue Mary, she starts to pluck petals from his rose, playing Loves Me, Loves Me Not with Gary's life. It's our first insight into how cruel Mary can be when she feels spurned and wants revenge. Eventually, Gary loses all his petals and collapses. It's up to you now to find a way to escape. Eventually, you make your way to Mary's lair, but before you can explore, an irate Mary finds you and starts chasing you with a knife. If you're quick enough, you can run to the other side of the room and find the frame where Mary's painting should be, with the glass broken and the canvas blank. As Mary begs you to stop, you take out Gary's lighter and burn the canvas. Mary perishes in a fiery blaze. But it's not a triumphant victory. A look through Mary's belongings shows symbols of her childhood, because after all, Mary is still a child, no matter how long she's been alive for. Crayons, drawings, a doll. A note she left behind reveals that all she wanted was to escape the painted world and live freely. She was waiting for someone to switch places with her, and it seems like you fit the bill perfectly. Still, how long has she been waiting here in this prison of scribbles and childish drawings? How agonizing must that waiting have been? I'm sure Mary didn't ask to be born, didn't want to be created as a sentient being just to live a trap life that drove her mad. Her final diary entry, Won't Somebody Come Soon, seems so poignantly pathetic in its childish impatience. If you open the last locked door in the crayon world, you return to the gallery from the beginning. Everything is dark though, devoid of people and quiet as the grave. It's an eerie place now compared to the cozy and bright gallery from the beginning. Eventually you find the huge canvas that started it all, though now the image is different. At this point, Gary enters the room and tells Abe that he's miraculously survived and found an exit. If you opt to leave with him, you exit the room hand in hand. Though the fact that this is the bad ending tells us all we need to know about whether this Gary is real or another imitation created by the gallery world to keep Abe from escaping. If, however, we jump into the painting and ignore Gary, we find ourselves back in the gallery with her parents. Though the painting that Gary was originally looking at is quite different. In the ideal ending, we can find Gary safe back in the gallery as well. Though his memories with Abe remain foggy, the connection they formed through their journey shines through, and promises a lasting friendship in the normal world. But as I said, I've never organically gotten this ending, and the way to get it seems rather obtuse. Now, Abe is far from a perfect game, but I think it's much more sophisticated from what you might expect from an RPG Maker horror game. Just as what I was talking about earlier with the way that children experience art museums, I think at the core of Ib's setting is the seemingly insurmountable gap that lies between us and the adult world when we're children. The notes written for your character, presumably left by Mary, or maybe even Guertana himself, display this. Come to a fun world without any grown-ups. I want you to have fun, Ib. And what does Ib really have in the adult world? She has parents, but they seem to treat her like a nuisance often, asking her to basically be seen, not heard, and preemptively assuming she'll be bored and unruly. This is reflected in Ib's nightmare, where the statues chide her for being lazy or careless when her flower breaks. Kids are constantly faced with accusations like this. What Mary offers, at least on surface level, is the opposite. A world of fun and childish delights. Think about what Mary's sanctum has. It's a world of butterflies, huge flowers, horses, squirrels, giant mounds of pudding. It's a world without adults, without the pressure from the adult world to shut up, act your age, keep to yourself. In fact, I think the two aspects of the gallery world represents this dichotomy. As I said to kids, modern art feels like an expression of the incomprehensibility of the adult world. Bizarre foreign shapes with ungraspable meanings that seem to fill no purpose but to exist. The earlier part of the gallery filled with Guertana's creations fit this bill perfectly. Mysterious, arcane, ominous. As children, we can't understand the things that concern adults. Credit cards and layoffs and debt and ambivalent resignation to life. That's why Mary's colorful crayon world seems almost designed to trap us after that. After all that horror and uncertainty, there's a world of fun and fantasy and imagination. But this idea that the adult world is inherently scary and mysterious and the child world is inherently fun and inviting isn't always true. Mary's childish and carefree demeanor conceals a cruel and treacherous nature, while Gary's an adult who in many ways still acts like a child, but also encourages Ib and expresses concern for her well-being and interest in her inner life. And as scary as the adult world can seem, what can be scarier than that central fear all children share that leads Ib forward through the horrors of the gallery world? That fear of losing one's parents, of being left behind. I think there's a quote at one point in the game that sums it all up perfectly. It's a strange interaction with the adult world. Because this is what art museums and encounters with modern art are like. A strange interaction with the adult world. A taste of what's to come later in life. So many parts of growing up are strange interactions with the adult world. And as perplexing or confusing or worrying as these moments are, they lead us forward. And I think that's what Ib is about. Embracing being a child, but not trying to retreat into childhood forever. Confronting the adult world, but realizing the ways in which we can still remain children. It's a beautiful idea nestled in a charming game. 
So how does Ib stack up after a decade and change? Is it a good game? Granted, I'm seeing it through nostalgia goggles, but I think it definitely is. The gameplay is less clever than I remember it, and the story is a bit hot and cold, but as I said, whether the developer meant it or not, it made me think about things I hadn't before. Plus, the music is incredible, and the half-scary, half-charming atmosphere still hit just as hard as it did in 2012, if not harder. The game is definitely less scary than I remember, but I'll chalk that up to me getting at least a tiny bit braver since I was in middle school. I liked the remake, and I love that it put the game back on my radar, but I would still side slightly with the original. I think the older, more authentic feel fits better, and the game is free and super easy to install, but the choice is yours. You can't go wrong with either. I think if I had to describe Abe in one word, it would be special. Special to me due to my time with it, but also special as a one-man dev and industry outsider using an esoteric software to bring a unique and charming world to life. The nightmarish but oddly adorable gallery of Ib will probably go down as one of my all-time favorite horror settings. Well, that's all for today. Thank you so much for your time, dear viewer. I wish you all the good fortune in the world. I remain your faithful snuggler. You pay the fits.